All right, again, for those of you who have just joined, thanks again for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us for the introductory webinar featuring Patty Ross. Uh, she's the latest member of the DTC Consultant Network, representing the Central Coast area, but also really working with wineries virtually throughout the U.S. I want a wealth of knowledge in direct-to-consumer wine sales, marketing, and e-commerce. This is Sandra Hess, founder of DTC Wine Workshops, and uh, today's webinar will take about 20 to 25 minutes. We will leave about five minutes at the end for open Q&A. So let's go ahead and uh, introduce Patty. So just a quick couple of notes about Patty's background. Um, like I mentioned, virtually for you supports wineries of all sizes nationally. And so she has a very interesting um, offering when it comes to direct to consumer marketing and e-commerce support. You'll find her bio page here on the DTC Wine Workshops website under the Meet the Network. And so just to touch on a few things here, she has over 20 years in online e-commerce marketing knowledge uh, with DTC marketing support for mainly small to medium-sized wineries. Um, you'll find that she has an ideal blend of, of technology and process improvement insights, um, having supported wineries of many different shapes over the past 20 years. Um, she brings to the table quite a bit of knowledge about how to help you take your e-commerce solutions um, and, and to the next level um, with direct-to-consumer wine sales marketing. So after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to reach her directly um, here and set some time to get better acquainted. So Patty, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm honored to be here, and I appreciate everybody taking a little bit of their lunch time to uh, spend with me. Welcome. To tell you a little bit about how I got started in the wine industry, I actually started on the technology side. Um, I worked for a company called. Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> I worked for a company called Inertia Beverage Group, which is now um, Wine Direct and now a Vin 65, I guess, in its new new form. So I started out helping wineries use software. I was their initial support trainer. I also did marketing and business development to help the uh, inertia customer sell their wine online. Um, it was all fairly new back in 2004. This is before social media even came on the market. Um, wineries were just starting to understand direct-to-consumer sales. So I worked for inertia for a couple of years and uh, decided to leave and I kind of fell into the whole virtual world when some of the inertia clients still needed my marketing and wine club assistance and it morphed into this virtually for you business where I helped various clients with uh, different aspects of their direct to consumer sales whether it was wine club uh, customer support um, email marketing social media eventually um, so a little bit of everything, as you can see from my first slide, these are all the services that I offer now. So to jump into what I will be talking about today, um, probably nothing new for some people, just covering the basics of direct-to-consumer and, and what you should be doing if you're not and reinforcing what you already are doing. So I'll be talking about building journeys with your visitors and the importance of data collection and what to do with it and how to use it. Uh, a little bit of e-commerce 101 and um, my mantra all the time, consistency. And then a little bit of what not to fear when you're dealing with direct-to-consumer uh, on for your winery. And then we'll end with a brief Q&A as Sandra mentioned. So to get started, building customer journeys. Um, and everyone who visits your tasting room should be invited on your bus. So customer journeys. Um, some passengers will stay on your bus for a long time. I know everybody strives to get everybody to be a long-term bus rider, club members. Um, some will hop off and on as occasional riders, those people who really are not joiners or haven't decided to join yet and will purchase wine from you and come visit but are just not ready for the long journey. And then some will just hop off and on. They'll come visit you. They might buy a bottle. You might never hear from them ever again. Um, you never know. So if you don't invite them on the bus, how do you know what kind of journey they're going to take with you? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So how do you ask them on the bus? 
all journeys start with data. This is one area that, it, for me, is marketing 101. It, it, and it kills me when I, I go to wineries, and I actually dealt, just dealt with a, a winery I worked with that did not collect any data in the tasting room, didn't have a sign-up form, didn't do anything to collect all those anonymous people that just walked in and walked out. They may have bought a bottle of wine, but they were checked into the POS as anonymous POS person. Um, unless they join the, the wine club, you have no idea who those people are. So here are some, you have multiple collection points as a winery. Your tasting room, obviously, if you have one, um, easy as putting out an, a sign-up form on your counters. Um, you can print little cards. You can, you know, go as you know, more high-tech can do um, kiosks. Uh, of some type, whatever you do, <laughs> electronic or not, make sure you're collecting the data there. Uh, wine events are another place you could be collecting data. People are coming up and tasting your wine at your table. Have a simple sign-up form. If you have tablets or kiosks, you know, put that on the table to make sure it's something they can't walk away with. And then, of course, your website. Um, I see a lot of winery websites that either bury their uh, sign-up form or they don't have it at all. And as you can see from this one example I pulled, um, upper right-hand corner is industry standards of where you should have it. Um, you know, don't, don't bury a link at the bottom of the page or don't put it on page, you know, five of your website. Make sure it appears on every possible place of your website. Um, there may be other places you can collect data, but these are your, your top places and make sure that you're collecting them and consistent. Um, I've talked with a winery recently, and they were. She explained to me that they were collecting data in their tasting room on a sign-up form and asking them how they wanted to be touched, how often, and, and what. Did you want to receive just wine information? Did you want just to learn about our events and or you know learn about our dogs or whatever it is? So they were able to check off you know, how to contact them and how often and, and what information they wanted. But when they went to their website and actually joined their mailing list, I just added my email and it said, great, you're on our mailing list. It, so it wasn't consistent with their tasting room where it would actually segment. So if you're going to segment in one place, you should segment everywhere. Um, and it's great if you can do that and you have the ability to segment and, and only send them the information they want. Just make sure that you know, you have a way of doing that everywhere. So, and so what data do you collect? Um, obviously the basics, name and email. Um, I know that a lot of people don't want to really ask for a lot of information or, or figure that, you know, people only are going to give up the very basic information. If you don't ask, you're, you know, you're not going to get the information at all. Um, optional phone number, which you could be using for text SMS messaging if you want to go in that direction. You can also do telemarketing campaigns, so it might be something that you do want to have. I'll talk about that more in, later. Um, special dates, birthdays, anniversaries. Um, of course, usually you'll collect birthdays for wine club members as you know, part of their uh, sign-up, but uh, who wouldn't want to receive a birthday card you know, or birthday email um, or an anniversary email from a winery you know, just as a, a touch point? And address. You can ask for their full mailing address if you decide to do print mailings. It's good information to have if they're willing to give it up. You know, some people want that touch, high touch um, aspect still. And the more information you're able to collect, the longer they're going to stay on your bus. And then what are you going to do with this information? So first thing and that I'm very passionate about is email marketing. And you can see from one of the quotes I pulled, for every one dollar spent on email marketing, the average return on investment is forty four twenty five. So why wouldn't you want to do email marketing? It has the highest conversion rate of uh, any marketing effort that you can do. And if you're not collecting that data and sending emails, you're you're losing that money. It's loss I call lost opportunity cost. So when I see hundreds of people leaving a tasting room on an annual basis anonymously, uh, just imagine all those dollars added up. Um, I can't even calculate in my head. Um, so what do you do with email marketing? Basics, create an annual email marketing calendar. 
plan ahead rather than do on the fly. And I, I see that people struggle with, oh, what do we send? I have no clue. And then they don't wind up doing it. They get busy with other things at the winery. So what I did with my clients first of every year is we sat down and we mapped out an entire calendar. Um, we of, of course, you put in all the holidays or the first thing. You do all of your release dates. Anything, any events that are pertinent to your um, location that you have, wine club pickup parties and your releases for your wine club. And then we started adding in things that would uh, enhance the experience. You know, we could do some new um, uh, tasting events, some new experiences. Um, so we had it all mapped out and to the day, what email is going to go out and when. So we knew, okay, we're going to be sending three or four emails this month. And maybe there were only two for the next month. So, you know, you had a, a sense of, you know, scheduling it out. And it went along like clockwork. So um, segmenting your list, if you're, like I mentioned with this other winery, that at least halfway segmented their list. And we're able to, you know, say, hey, I only want to receive information about your events and or only about your wine releases. So if you have the ability to segment your list, um, you can then send different emails to different groups and send different messages. You know, maybe your wine club members get a different message than your um, non-members. Um, you need to figure out what segments work for you. And then third year, test, test, test. You can test the segments. You can do A-B testing if you're familiar with that. Trying two different messages to see which one works better. Um, it's not always going to be a cut and dry cookie cutter. Um, approach to email marketing. Um, and if you're analyzing, which I didn't put on here, if you're analyzing email marketing success, looking at open rates and click-through rates, what messages work, what time of the day, there's a whole art and science to when emails should be sent and when they're open. And, and I could go on with email marketing for, for days here, um, but there's you know, all, 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 the whole market has changed even with mobile and, and everybody having email marketing literally in their hands all day with their um, smartphones, you know, so it's not just a desktop environment any longer. So as far as what type of campaigns, nothing here that's really uh, shocking or different. Uh, new releases, um, back of seller sales, which I'll give you a case study on that in a minute. Um, events, of course, what's happening at the winery, you know, your harvest, family, milestones, anything educational, you know, some, you know, how to taste wine and what glasses to use, you know, things that are useful for them and they may not find elsewhere. And so back of the seller sales, I had a client that we did, and, and you don't always have to have hundreds of cases or, or think that you, you need to have a warehouse full of wine in order to send an email. At a client that we did, we called it the back of the seller sale, where they had, I mean, about 15 to 25 cases of one of their popular wines, and it, it basically was kind of sitting in the library. And they said, well, why don't we do a back of the seller? There's only 15, literally only 15 to 25 cases left. I don't even think they did it on a discounted price, like a wine club discount only, and sent it out to their wine club members first and say, you have first opportunity to buy this wine. And, you know, at this, we're not going to have it ever again. And it, it sold out within, I think it was about 15 minutes. Um, it was pretty quick. Uh, the email went out. I think the wine club members bought it all up before we even had a chance to send it to their general consumer mailing list. So um, even if it's small incremental sales, um, not hundreds and hundreds of cases, you know, they like that exclusivity. Um, wine club members want to be behind that velvet rope. So if they can get some special, you know, behind the scenes sales and, and it looks at even if it's not a sale, um, a promotional price, it's a exclusive offer of the, you're, you're the only ones being offered this wine, kind of like allocation. So um, think outside the box when it comes to email. There's a lot of different ways you can approach it and being consistent. Um, that's, again, my mantra. Don't give up. Don't email once and give up. Um, be as consistent as you possibly be with the message because you're not always going to be able to reach everybody um, at the same time ready to buy. So I'll, I'll talk more about that. And social media. Oh, this is the fun part. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure most people do have at least one 
um, social network platform that you're using. And as you can see from this quote, 70% of the U.S. population has at least one social network profile. So we're all engaged. We're out there. We're listening. What you need to do is get out there as well. Um, figure out where you're to best engage your writers along the journey. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, LinkedIn, there's a million of them. Um, but do a few of them and do them well. Don't try to do everything. Um, then you're going to leave some where you're not even engaging anymore because you have way too much to do. Um, again, I've created an annual social media calendar. I did this along with the email marketing calendar for my clients. Kind of follow the same format. You plug in all the events the holidays, the um, releases, all the things that are important to your winery, and then build from there. And figuring out what to post, there is a, there is a method to the madness. And I tried to explain this to a winery I was working with. I'm, post I'm posting for them that it seemed odd at some points as to the why and how, but there's different levels of engagement with different types of posts, and you're kind of building on that engagement and reach with each type of post. So whether you're selling, which you should do minimally, um, educating, humoring them, telling them what's going on with your winery, um, what the next one, be authentic. Um, this is, uh, I know Jeff Stye at Twisted Oak will appreciate the reference to the rubber chicken. If anybody you're familiar with Twisted Oak Winery up in Murphy's, um, Jeff kind of pioneered social media for wineries, I believe. And when I say find your own rubber chicken, if you visit their winery and, and their website, you'll see their whole thing has been about rubber chickens. They sell rubber chickens in their taste room. They had it way before the social media and website came out. I don't know what why they started selling rubber chickens, but that's their shtick. And everybody knows that they did bring your rubber chicken to work days and a contest where you take a picture of your you and your rubber chicken. Um, everybody knew about their rubber chicken. So I would tell my clients, find your own rubber chicken. You know, it doesn't have to be something kitschy like a, a rubber chicken, but find what's authentic about you and different. You know, yes, you sell great wine. Yes, you have beautiful vineyards. You have a gorgeous tasting room, but so do a lot of your neighbors. <laughs> so I say find out what is off, what speaks to you and, and your staff and, and the owners, um, what makes it authentic to you. And I'll, I'll give you an example at the end of a client that I had that it was kind of a fun case study that tied all this together, and it was their rubber chicken. So I'll go over that in a few minutes. And then, so as far as social media, it's the clearly changed. Facebook, uh, oh gosh, two to three percent organic reach. I heard it's almost dropping to zero percent soon enough. That means that, you know, if you have 5,000 fans on or likers on your Facebook page, you send out a post, you might only hit two to three percent of that that will actually see that on their Facebook feed. So um, it's really become a pay to play. Um, social network. You, not to say you should stop doing uh, posts and, and doing things to try to get organic reach, but just be aware that you're not going to hit everybody all the time. Um, the more you engage, the more engagement you're going to get. What you post will vary with engagement, and that's going back to you know working your method to your badness of what what sell what works on on posting and when and what time of day. Um, you can do um, Facebook advertising, uh, boost posts. There's also Facebook retargeting that ties into collecting email lists. Um, just going back to email and how it can tie to social media, if you're collecting email addresses um, in various locations, you can actually load those emails into Facebook and they will spit out how many of them match up on Facebook. And I've, I've seen across various types of businesses that I've done this with, about 50% of them get matches. So now you can market to those people on Facebook. So that's something to consider as well. There's also Twitter advertising. Pinterest has advertising now. So you can socially sell. You know, have a wine store on Facebook and sell on Pinterest now. So 
So there's a lot of avenues to explore other than just saying, hey, I need to put up a post once a week or once a day or tweet. It, it, there's a lot out there. That this could be a whole seminar on just social, social media. And again, be consistent. Um, pick a few and do them well. Post as often as you can. Figure out a schedule. Do a calendar. And then as far as other avenues um, for keeping your writers on their journey, um, text, SMS. Um, you can use it for selling. That's, you know, the, I think probably are fairly new, but I think just using it for wine club reminders, if you have that ability to do that in your um, software, um, it's a new way to reach people. Um, might work better than just sending out the emails that we normally do. Um, telemarketing. People love to hear from wineries. I, I would call uh, help wineries with wine clubs, and usually I was calling on declines for my clients and you would still get that hey this is patty from winery x and they would get excited about it even if i was calling for a new credit card number so they love to hear from you it's to figure out who your audience is um, you might have a list of older members who don't respond well to social media or email marketing and they might respond better you have if you have date of birth you can kind of figure that out you know if these members are 50 plus or 60 plus or you know, perhaps a phone call would work better. You know, so it's something to add into the mix if you want to. And then print mail. Um, if you want to use it still, of course, it is a little bit more costly than, than sending out email or doing social media. There may be uses for it at your winery, um, maybe for wine club members as a welcome card. Rather than just sending an email, you can do a little um, kind of gift type card, thank you card for joining. Um, so that would be something you'd have to figure out in your budget. And if you're collecting the addresses, that would be a good reason to be using it. Um, blog. Uh, kind of in the social media realm, I'd say only do this if you can keep up with it. I, I've seen a lot of blogs on wineries and others that they may have one or two blog posts and then they haven't done anything since 2000 and late. Um, I would say... Only do it and keep up with it if you have somebody who can consistently do it. Um, otherwise, it just looks like you gave up. So, And then social media. What works on social media? Doing cool stuff and pictures of animals. This was kind of a last bit of humor I added in. Um, this is me on my motorcycle and, and me and my dog. These are probably two of the top engaged uh, posts I ever put on my Facebook page. Um, people like, I don't know, I think maybe there's a level of danger and craziness and, and of course, cute dogs, me and my little pug, Roxy. So uh, kind of a joke, but not really. Um, people want um, authenticity. They want to see people. They, want, they do want to see your animals if you have them at the winery. They want to know who your staff are, who's serving them. You know, and, and if there are cool things that you do at the winery, put them up. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's all about people. Um, it's not just about the wine. So so that's it on social media and email marketing. And I've added in um, some information on e-commerce e 101. One. Build it and they will come, right? <laughs> when I worked at Inertia and we built websites and, and bolted on the, the software platform to run the sites, I think we had quite a few clients who thought, well, we'll just build a site and people will show up and start buying. And I think we all know it doesn't work that way. Wish it did, but there's a little bit of extra work you have to do to get those people to the site other than just build it. So um, right at this time when, you know, back in 2004 when I was working with them, um, we didn't have... Uh, smartphones and, and tablets and different ways of viewing your website. You basically had desktops and laptops. Um, so now you have the advent of mobile-friendly sites, responsive, if you're familiar with that. It's your website that you can shrink down to tablet or phone size, and it will appear better for the mobile users. If you don't have a mobile-friendly, responsive site now, change it, um, update it. Um, I just visited a local winery website and noticed it wasn't responsive, and I'm, you know, doing the pinching and, and uh, expanding to see their website and to click on things. Um, did not want to make me want to purchase or even 
look at their wine club information. It was just, you know, and with my bad sight, <laughs> I, you know, I wear my, uh, get my magnifying glass out. So make sure that you are mobile friendly because more interactions are happening on mobile these days. Um, if you look at your Google Analytics, you'll actually see who's visiting your site on a mobile um, device versus a desktop. So that information is out there and you can see who, who's accessing it. People are driving around with their cell phones looking for a winery to visit and if they visit your site on their cell phone, you need to make sure it's mobile friendly. Um, do you need an app for that? This came up in a discussion the other day. I was sitting in on a winery association meeting and somebody mentioned having an app. And it's like, if you have a responsive site, you don't really need to have an app. Um, I think there's going to be a, we're at that um, level of where, because we have responsive sites and people can, you know, pe are becoming more mobile friendly, people might not be wanting to download an app. So that might be something that you may or may want to visit. And it's something separate you'd have to update in addition to your website. So. I wouldn't get too caught up that you don't have a mobile app. I would be more concerned if you have a responsive site that can be seen in various sizes um, as opposed to having separate mobile apps. At least that's my opinion out there. And as far as content, content matters. Um, don't just list your wines, of course. Um, you need more content to draw people in. Tell your story. Um, again, I, I have another website that I went to go look up information about. And there is nothing on their site that tells me who owns the winery, who, how it started, when it started, what's their philosophy. I I have no clue. I had to go. I was going to Google like who who owns this winery? <laughs> Why did they start this winery? Um, there was nothing on there to, to tell me who the people are behind this winery. This is all about the wine, and yes, we grow it organically, sustainably. That's great, but who are you? Um, don't leave off that information because that's what people want to see as well. So make sure you have plenty of content other than just listing your wines for sale. And um, and then as far as analytics, do you know who's visiting? Do you know who's sending traffic? I'm a total metrics freak, admittedly. Um, I first thing I do when I with a new client and we're talking about working together is I ask for all the under the hood access. I look at all the Google Analytics. Facebook insights, social media, they have Zen tanks, social media insights. What is it, what's going on? Who's sending traffic your way? Who's visiting? Um, what type, are they mobile? Are they you know, not mobile? There's a ton of information um, on Google Analytics that you should be looking at. And I, I know it can be overwhelming if you're not familiar with it, but you can start in little chunks. Um, of getting at least the basics down and, and the basics would be who's visiting, who's sending traffic your way, referrals, and, um, you know, at least mobile, um, you know, who's looking mobile and who's not. Just a lot more information on there, of course, to look at. And is your site optimized to help bring traffic? Um, search engine optimization, um, a lot of wineries build a website. They don't really look underneath and see, are we mobile friendly? Do we have keywords on our site and meta tags, which you know may or may not still be important, but at least in, con and in content in there that tells you where you're located, what you sell, um, you know, there's a whole science behind it and what kind of content you put up to help draw traffic. Um, so if you haven't already looked at SEO, that might be something to look at, whether you hire a company separately or have somebody in-house help you do that. And then online marketplaces or other out, outside of your website places to sell wine, you need to figure out what, what the best places are to sell your wine, and not all of them make sense for everyone. You know, the flash sale sites and, you know, Amazon Marketplace and you know, a lot of other ones, but I, I don't want to mention too many of them because I don't want anybody to get caught up in going and checking them out. You need to figure out who you are and which ones work for you. Um, and, and not everyone will, uh, will work for everyone. So as far as tying this all together, um, how to make it work in the case study I wanted to share, I had a client located here in the Central Coast where I live now, and we figured out their rubber chicken. Um, their rubber chicken, like mine, um, is we love animals. And uh, what started this whole um, 
campaign, tying this all together with them, is this particular winery had an amazing golden retriever that had just passed away. Allegedly, everybody knew this retriever, and it could juggle three balls in its mouth at the same time. Um, their, their tasting room manager contacted me and said, hey, Patty, we need to send an email out to members and let them know that the dog passed away because they'll want to know. And I was like, well, I can do that, but I know we could do better. And I know everybody would want to know that she passed away, but how can we make this into something? And given their love for animals and my love for animals, I said, well, why don't we make it into a event to help animals? So we contacted the local Humane Society, and we started an event called Cops for the Paws. We actually also did one for cats uh, at Christmas time called Santa Claus and um, had animals at the winery for adoption. We um, uh, donated money to their facility with the money, and we eventually tied in all of the wineries of that location along the same highway um, in Paso. So the association of 12 members, uh, we created a cause for the Paws Passport. Um, we made, you know, everybody became a little bit more dog friendly, having biscuits and water out for the dogs. And all of them raised, helped raise money for the Humane Society and drew attention to my client um, winery because we had the dogs there for adoption. We had agility course training there and some other dog training things. So we made it an annual event. So we also... Um, then created a wine club um, that was a cause for the Paws Wine Club. So it was separate than their normal wine club where you could join it and a portion of the proceeds of the wine club went to the Humane Society. So we tied in, um, social media was fairly new at that time to start it. So we had started tying that in via Facebook and Twitter. We would send out emails about the club and about the event. Um, of course, with e-commerce, we were selling um, wine um, that also benefited the Humane Society uh, in the tasting room and online. So it, it tied everything together and it brought their on authenticity out. This was what they were about and people knew to come to the winery to meet the dogs. And of course, they adopted a couple of dogs at the first event, adopted a couple of cats at the cat event. So I told them to save some for other people. <laughs> but um, it, you know, they and everybody knew we set them up as dog friendly. I went out to dog friendly websites to let them know they can come visit this winery and bring their pet as well. Um, so that was their their rubber chicken, and that whole event brought in the events brought in money for them, brought in money for the Humane Society, and it wasn't something that was phony for them because that's something they really believed in and loved animals. So. Um, I was really proud that they were able to do that and raise money for a cause that was near and dear to me as well. So, And then as far as my mantra, consistency. I like that consistency is better than rare moments of greatness. Um, you know, make sure that you are consistent with your efforts, whether it's social media or email marketing. And you may not always reach your audience the first time. They might not always be ready to engage and buy. Um, the more you engage, the more engagement you will get. Um, so you always want to be, again, consistent with that. And if you cannot do it well consistently yourself, hire someone who can, whether it's in-house or a consultant. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're always, um, you know, out there and doing something and not just doing it once. So, And then have no fear. So I maybe it's, Maybe it's a little bit less these days as, as new ways to market are, are coming out and there's less fear, but it seemed that wineries were always afraid to even reach out to their wine club members um, only at the times that they were sending out their club because there was always this fear that the member would want to automatically cancel right then and there as soon as you called them or, or reached out to them. So I always said, have no fear. Um, you want to ask for the information from your visitors, you know, put out the mailing list, sign up form, put out the iPad to ask for it. Um, you know, if you don't ask for it, you're going to have no way to get those dollars back from them and to continue to market and continue them on your bus and the journey. Um, asking for the sale. You know, whether it's you're asking in the tasting room, you know, hey, would you like to take a bottle of wine? 
or what would you like to take home? Um, ask me online, um, on social media. You know, don't don't fear asking for it. You know, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Right? And don't fear reaching out to your audience, uh, whether it's wine club members that you already have, you know, credit card information for, or new people that you are bringing along on the journey. Don't be afraid to reach out. I say if if members are um, ready to cancel, you know, that comes to don't be afraid to lose customers. They're not your brand ambassadors. They're not, they're, they're people maybe who are chasing a discount at the time of tasting and, and want that little extra out the door, but really um, aren't there for that long bus ride. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out. They do want to hear from you. They do want those special experiences. They do want to know that they're a VIP um, for you. And try new ways to reach out and retain the audience. You know, don't don't stick with one or two methods. Test, test, test. Try different things. Try a little bit of social media advertising. Try the email marketing. You know, there's, uh, maybe do some telemarketing and see how that works out. You, you know, you're never going to know until you try it. Um, and I say just don't be afraid uh, of trying anything when it comes to marketing. Um, and the um, bottom line on all of this, ask them on the bus. Keep them engaged enough to want to stay on the bus. Ask them how they're enjoying the ride often. Don't be afraid to try new routes and explore new places as the journey progresses and expect some folks will want off the bus along the way. And that is the end of my presentation. I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them.